Okay, we are going to start tonight. This is part four on a series entitled As a Thief in the Night. So this is part four. We're going to do one more message on Sunday. Uh, <laughs> light chuckle in the audience. I could do, honestly, I could do 10 one-hour teachings on this subject. So to get it all done in five hours is pretty good for me. Uh, but we're going to do one more teaching on Sunday where we're going to look at uh, prophecy related to um, the flood of Noah, the days of Noah, and the days of Lot, because those are two indicators where Jesus said, uh, before the coming of the Son of Man, it's going to be just like it was in the days of Noah and just like it was in the days of Lot uh, in Sodom and Gomorrah. And so uh, I don't want to skip over that. We're going to look at that on Sunday. Uh, tonight we are continuing the message from, uh, from this last Sunday, and I've entitled this message this evening, the subtitle is Not Appointed to Wrath, as we're looking at the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. And let's start in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 9. This is one of the key uh, scriptures where we are told that we are not appointed unto wrath. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 9. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. You have to have the proper context before you can build a doctrine from one verse. And so we never want to build a doctrine from one verse. That's called a building a doctrine on a pretext. You have to read the text in its proper context, which means you have to read what comes before it. In the original writings, there were no chapter breaks. It was just one scroll uh, written. Uh, New Testament was written in Greek or Aramaic. And, you know, when they would read 1 Thessalonians, it would be one scroll. It didn't have chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 5, verse 9. It was all one message. So to get the proper context of what Paul is talking about when he tells this church, don't worry, God didn't appoint us unto wrath. Uh, we're appointed unto salvation. And whether we wake or whether we sleep, speaking about dying, we're going to live together with him and we can comfort one another and edify or build one another up in this truth. You go back to what he's talking about for the context. In the previous chapter in 1 Thessalonians 4 in verse 15, he's talking about the resurrection of the dead. He's talking about the rapture of the church. He says this in verse 15 of chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep or those who have died in Christ. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up the uh, Greek word is harpazo, for the two words caught up in our English. Uh, it's also translated raptus or raptos in the Latin, from which we get the English word rapture. We who are alive and remain shall be caught up or raptured together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. And again, he says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. So the doctrine of the rapture of the church is to be a comforting message, not a message of survival through the worst part of, uh, of human history. The last, you know, three and a half years is going to be so bad uh, during the tribulation period that Jesus said uh, that unless those days were cut short, literally no flesh would survive on the earth. That's how bad it's going to be. The worst time in all of human history, even worse uh, than the flood of Noah, because Jesus said it's going to be the worst time in human history, and if the days were not cut short, no flesh would survive. And so Paul is, is not telling us, be comforted. You're going to be here till the end of the worst time in human history, worse than the flood, 
And if you happen to be the 10 or 15% of the people who survived the tribulation period, then Jesus is going to come back and rapture you. No, that would make no sense at all. He would be telling you, be strong, be warned. You're going to have to face the Antichrist. You're going to have to deal with the devil. You're going to get beheaded. You're going to have to not take the mark of the beast. He doesn't tell us this. He just says it's going to happen. When it happens, it's going to happen uh, instantaneously, imminently, immediately, and it's a comforting message. The rapture of the church is a message of comfort. If it's halfway through the tribulation, you still have to deal with uh, half of the tribulation with the devil running the world. That's not a comforting message to have to live under the devil, the Antichrist, even for three and a half years, much less uh, for the great tribulation period, which is the last three and a half years. But then he goes right into chapter five. Again, no chapter breaks in the original scroll. Continuing the same thought, he says, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. Not upon you, not upon us, when they, the unbelievers, say peace and safety. That's what they're going to say when the Antichrist rides in on his white horse. We'll get there when we get to Revelation chapter 6 and verse 2 with the four horsemen of the apocalypse. When the Antichrist comes riding in as a deceiver uh, in the place of uh, Jesus Christ, comes in on a white horse and brings a bow and brings a false peace to the earth. This is what they're going to say. They're going to say peace and safety when the devil's man comes into power at the beginning of the tribulation period. Not, not us. That's what they say. Then sudden destruction comes upon them, the unbelievers, not upon us, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape, not us, we're going to be raptured, they shall not escape. But you, brethren, you are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And comfort, he says the second time in verse 11 of 1 Thessalonians 5, comfort one another with these words. Again, there's no way Paul with a straight face could tell the church to be comforted by the doctrine of a post-tribulation rapture. That would be the opposite of a comforting message. That would be a horrible message. That would be a terrible message. That would be a terrifying message to hear from God. Thankfully, that's not the message of the Bible. The Bible tells us that the rapture is going to happen. Church is going to be taken off the scene and then the Antichrist is going to come to power. This is what we believe. This is what Calvary Chapel believes, the pre-tribulational rapture of the church. Now, we know that we are not going to have to stand under the wrath of God. We're not going to be judged by God. Jesus was already judged by God the Father on the cross of Calvary. And we know that the time of the tribulation period is the time of the wrath of God being poured out upon Satan and his cohorts and the Antichrist and the false prophet and all those who are going to follow the beast and follow the Antichrist and follow the false prophet. As a matter of fact, we read, in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 15. Or ver we'll just skip to verse 16 for the sake of time. These who are there, when Christ comes back, they say this, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, that's God the Father, and from the wrath of the Lamb, that's God the Son. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Now, what did we just read in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9? We're not appointed to wrath. This is the time of God's wrath being poured out like no time in history before. And so we know the church cannot be here for this time. We're told in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10 as a reminder. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial or testing or tribulation which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. That's the promise to the faithful little church of Philadelphia, the last day's church that has kept his word and has not denied 
his name. Jesus says, don't worry, I'm going to keep you from this hour. It's ek, keep you out of, in the Greek, this time. You're not going to be here for this time. Don't worry, because you've kept my command to persevere. I will keep you out of the hour of tribulation or trial or testing that is going to come upon the whole world to test all of those on the earth. We know that Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1 is where John, the beloved disciple, is snatched up and taken as a picture or a type of the church taken up into heaven. And the first word that we read uh, is after these things. That is the Greek word meta tauta, or two words, after these things. Well, where did we hear after these things before in the book of Revelation? Well, it was in the divine outline that Jesus gave us in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 19, where Jesus told John, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after these things. Metatauta. Write the things which you've seen. He wrote everything he saw. That's Revelation chapter 1. The vision of Jesus Christ appearing to him with eyes like a flame of fire and feet and legs like burnished bronze. Uh, a voice like the sound of many waters and all the rest. He wrote what he saw. The revelation of Jesus Christ. John fell as a dead man before his feet and Jesus told him, uh, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. That's what he saw. That's chapter 1. The things which are. Those are the present things of the church age. For the last 2,000 years, it's been the church age. It's the epoch, the dispensation, or the era of the church. The church was a mega musterion. It was a huge mystery because it wasn't re revealed really in the Old Testament. It was only revealed to the New Testament writers. The church was a mystery. The church's birthday was on the day of Pentecost. That's when the Holy Spirit came and filled them with the Spirit. And they were filled with the Spirit. And they were born again by the Spirit by believing on Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit came to dwell within man. That was a very unusual thing. That didn't happen. The only time that happened where the Spirit of God was dwelling within in man prior to this time was in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve prior to the fall of man. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God, the Spirit of God who had dwelt within them departed, and now God was outside of them, no longer living within them. So this is a restoration. Pentecost was a restoration of the Holy Spirit coming back to his rightful place within man because man was created in God's image, body, soul, and spirit. And the Spirit of God came back to dwell within the hearts of his people for the first time since Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden. And the birth of the church took place on Pentecost. That kicked off the church age. The church age has been in effect for 2,000 years. Jesus said prophetically, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will never prevail against my church. No matter what Satan has done, no matter what Satan has thrown at the church, here we are alive and well some 2,000 years later on the earth because Jesus said the church is going to prevail. Even the devil can't stop the church. The gates of hell cannot prevail against my church. These are the things which are the things presently of the epochs or eras of church history. The seven churches, the seven letters to the seven churches, Revelation chapters two and three. Go back and listen to the messages if you were not here. This is what Jesus says, write the things which are. Then after these things, metatauta, after what things, Jesus? After the things of the church age are completed. So the first thing that we read in Revelation 4.1, after all the red letters of Jesus dictating these seven letters to the seven churches come to a conclusion, it is metatauta, after these things. And behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here, and I will show you the things which must take place, metatauta, after these things. After what things? After the things of the church age are over. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne. And from that point on, John is no longer seeing things on the earth from earth's perspective. He's seeing things on the earth happening from heaven's perspective. He's in heaven looking down upon the earth, picturing and shadowing, foreshadowing the rapture of the church taking place before the Antichrist is revealed, before the Antichrist comes to power, before the mark of the beast and all the rest of it, we are going to be taken up 
into heaven. Then we see these 24 mysterious elders who are in heaven, and they're taking their crowns, and they're throwing their crowns down at the feet of the Lamb who sits on the throne. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 10. The 24 elders fall down before Him who sits on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever, and they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Now these 24 elders we believe, are symbolic of the church, the elders of the church, likely the 12 apostles and then 12 others who we don't know who they are because we're not told, but it's likely that 12 of them are the 12 apostles with Paul the apostle being the replacement for Judas Iscariot, most likely. It could be Matthias, I suppose, but it's more likely to be Paul the apostle. But these 24 elders fall down and worship him who sits on the throne and they have crowns on their head. Now who has crowns on their head in heaven except for God, except for Jesus? Well, the church does because the church is given crowns. There are different crowns listed that the church receives. What do they do with their crowns? They cast them at the feet of Jesus. And then in chapter 5 and verse 8, we read this about these 24 elders. When he had taken the scroll, we'll get to it. It's the title deed to planet earth that Jesus purchased with his blood. We'll get to it in a few weeks. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, that is Jesus Christ, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals for you were slain. And you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Now this is something that only the church can say. Only the church can say, Jesus, the Lamb of God, His blood has redeemed us. We've been redeemed back to God by His blood. And this is what they sing. You've redeemed us to God by your blood. So what would that, what would that mean? It would mean that the church is in heaven at this point prior to the tribulation period starting. How do we know it's the church? Because we are called a kingdom of priests in the scriptures. We're going to rule and reign with Christ as a kingdom of priests forever and ever. That's who these 24 elders are. They say in verse 10 of Revelation 5, have made us, you have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. This is the church. So the church is not on the earth during the tribulation period. The church is safely ensconced away, tucked away with her bridegroom, getting ready and prepared for the marriage supper of the Lamb and the reward ceremony of Jesus Christ in heaven. Remember that Jesus, when he was talking about the things of the last days, even though the rapture was certainly a great mystery and Jesus really did not clearly teach the rapture of the church while he was teaching, uh, but you could certainly find allusions to the rapture of the church. Paul's the one who really came out and really detailed the rapture of the church for us because, again, it was a mystery to the Old Testament saints. But Jesus says this in Luke 21 and verse 34. Jesus says, take heed to yourselves, after talking about all of the things that are going to happen on the earth, the tribulation period, uh, the, the, the signs in the heavens, and the, the, the moon being turned to blood, and the sun being turned black like sackcloth, and the stars of the heavens falling, and earthquakes all over the earth, the tribulation period. Jesus says this, but you take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighted down with sexual carousing, with drunkenness, and with the cares of this life. And that day come upon you unexpectedly, for it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the faith, face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So Jesus just gave us the escape plan. Jesus just gave us the rescue plan. He's going to rescue us before these things happen. That's what he says. Be aware. Be alert. Don't be bogged down with sexual carousing and drunkenness and just being consumed with the cares of this world. He says, you watch. Look up. For when you begin to see these things happen, Luke 21, 28, and lift up your heads because your redemption draws 
near. Watch therefore, pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. The post-trib guys say that we're all just a bunch of escapists. We're preaching escapism. Well, that's okay because Jesus told us that we're going to escape these things. We're not coming up with this. It's from the lips of Jesus Christ. Pray that you may be counted worthy to escape these things. What things? All the terrible things that he listed in Luke 21 about the tribulation period. So I think we're on good, solid, scriptural ground when we teach the pre-tribulation rapture. And again, we could be wrong. Is it possible that Calvary's wrong and Chuck Smith is wrong and John Wolvert and H.A. Ironside and Dwight Pentecost and all these great, brilliant, genius theologians of the last 200 years that they're wrong about this? It's possible, but it's not probable because I think that we have very good, solid scriptural evidence for the fact that the rapture is going to take place and then the tribulation period is going to begin. Matthew 24 and verse 42 Our Lord Jesus said this, Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. He says in verse 36 of Matthew 24, But of that day, the day of his return, and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Verse 43 of Matthew 24, But know this, Jesus says, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, He would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour or a time or a day that you do not expect. There's no possible way Jesus could say this if it's going to be halfway through the tribulation period or at the end of the tribulation period. Everybody's going to be expecting it who knows the scriptures at that time. But if it were to happen today... If it would have happened a month ago, a year ago, a week from now, five years from now, right? Is everybody expecting it? No. To this day, Christians aren't expecting it. Most Christians aren't even looking for it. So this is what Jesus says. He says, be ready. The Son of Man, speaking of himself, who is the thief in the night, is coming at an hour that you do not expect. In Matthew chapter 25 and verse 13, Jesus says it again. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Again, the only doctrinal position that could allow for this is the pre-tribulational rapture position. Because it could happen at any time. We continue to look at the Olivet Discourse. This is kind of where we were last uh, Sunday. In Matthew chapter 24... In verse 15, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who were in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the sake of the elect, literally the chosen people, the chosen ones is what the word elect means, those days will be shortened. So then who is Jesus talking to if he's not talking to the church? He's talking to the Jews because the tribulation period is all about Israel. It has nothing to do with the church. It's all about God restoring and redeeming the chosen people of Israel. That's the whole purpose of the tribulation period. And that's why he says, when you see the abomination, now who's going to see the abomination? The Jews. It's going to be in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount where the temple that's going to be rebuilt is defiled. The abomination of desolation. This is Jesus is talking to the Jews. He's not talking to the church. The church has nothing to do with a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, but the Jews will have everything to do with the rebuilt temple. That's going to be where they go to worship God. We're going to look at the abomination of desolation here in, in just a few minutes, but Jesus is talking to those in Jerusalem. That's not the church. The church isn't based in Jerusalem. Some would argue the church is based in Rome, but I would argue against it. I would say the whore of Babylon may be based in Rome, as we're going to see. 
but not the church. The church is everywhere all over the earth. We don't have a single place like Jerusalem where the church always gathers, but the Jews do. That place is Jerusalem, the Holy of Holies, the Temple Mount. This is to the Jews. He says, those who are in Judea. Where's Judea? It's outside of Jerusalem. That's not apparent uh, for us. That has nothing to do. It's not relevant to the church. It's not relevant to the church all over the world. But it is relevant to the Jews who will be in Jerusalem at this time. When the abomination of desolation takes place, Jesus is warning the Jews, flee. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, let the reader understand, flee out of Jerusalem, flee out of Judea, run to the mountains. Some believe that the Jews are going to actually go to the rock city of Petra in Jordan, and God is going to preserve and protect them there in that rock-fortified city for the three and a half years of the great tribulation period. Jesus goes on, let him who is on the housetop not go down and take anything. Let him who's in the field not go back and get his clothes. Woe to those who are pregnant, to those who are nursing babies, because it's going to be pretty radical. It's all going to happen very quickly. It's going to be hard to get out of Dodge if you're nine months pregnant or if you're nursing a baby. And then, in case there's any question who he's talking to, Jesus says this, Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. Where's the only place in the world where everything shuts down on the Sabbath day? Only Jerusalem. Not even Tel Aviv, which is the capital of Israel. The secular capital of Israel is Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv doesn't shut down on the Sabbath day. Uh, the Dead Sea resorts don't, well, you can't push the buttons on the elevator on the Sabbath day in, in the Dead Sea resorts. We'll see that when we go there. But, uh, you know, the the, the Tel Aviv doesn't shut down. The Dead Sea resorts don't shut down on the Sabbath day. Not like Jerusalem. The Sea of Galilee and the regions of Capernaum in Israel do not shut down on the Sabbath day. However, in Jerusalem, everything stops on the Sabbath day. So who is this for? This is not to the church, guys. This is not to the Christian. This is to the Jew. Because the tribulation period is God's plan to save the nation of Israel. Again, Jesus says, for then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. Meaning it's going to even be worse than the flood of Noah, if you could imagine that. And then Jesus says, and unless those days were shortened, verse 22 of Matthew 24, no flesh would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. And in my Bible, elect is translated chosen ones. And who are the chosen people of Israel? Uh, or the chosen people of God? The nation of Israel. They are the chosen people. So this is to the Jews. This is God's plan to fulfill all of the promises and the prophecies to the nation of Israel that God had previously made through the prophets. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 13, we read this. Paul writing to Titus, he says this. Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's talking about two different things, two different aspects of the second coming of Christ. There's only one second coming of Jesus Christ, but the second coming of Christ begins with the rapture of the church and then culminates with Jesus setting his feet upon the Mount of Olives. It's called the day of the Lord, the day of God's wrath, even though it's a seven year period of time, it's called the day of the Lord. So we're looking for the blessed hope. And when Jesus Christ sets up his kingdom, it will be his glorious appearing. So looking for the blessed hope, this is the rapture of the church, and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You remember that Jesus said to his disciples in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, before he was about to go to the cross of Calvary. Jesus said this to them, let not your heart be troubled, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places or mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. So Jesus is talking about, I'm leaving, I'm going to heaven 
to my father's house. I'm going to go and build mansions for you. He's a carpenter. He's going to go and build mansions for his bride, for the church. He says, I'm going to my father's house where there's many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to heaven to prepare a mansion for you, he says, I am going to come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. This is not speaking about his second coming at the end of the tribulation period to rule and reign over the earth for a thousand years and then for all eternity. He's talking about us going to heaven, to his father's house, to the mansions in heaven. This is speaking of our gathering together with him at the rapture of the church. In 2 Thessalonians and chapter 2, and verse 1, Paul the Apostle writing a second letter to the church in Thessalonica because there had been some confusion that had crept in regarding the day of the Lord, regarding the fact that some of them thought they'd missed the day of the Lord and missed the rapture of the church. And so Paul wrote them a second letter referring back to the first letter that he wrote them. And he says this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. Now brethren... Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. Notice it's two aspects of the second coming of Christ. The second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's where Jesus will come to set up his kingdom and set his feet on the Mount of Olives. To rescue Israel from the Antichrist. To uh, throw the Antichrist and the false prophet into the lake of fire. To bind Satan for a thousand years. He says, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ to set up his kingdom. And our gathering together with him. Now what's our gathering together with him? The rapture of the church. He's referring back to what he wrote them in 1 Thessalonians Chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. He says, Don't be soon shaken or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though that day of Christ had already come and you missed a rapture. And then he's going to go on to give him more detail about what will happen and what is coming. It's interesting if you go back to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Prior to this verse here in, in chapter 2 and verse 1, we read this in verse 7. First, uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, he says this, And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the wrath of God, by the way, being poured out upon a Christ-rejecting world, not upon the church. This is the judgment of God with the holy angels, the mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God. And on those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord. That's not for the church. We're not going to be here for these things. These are for God's enemies. Just think about it. Do you treat your enemies the same way you treat your children? Think about it for a minute. Is God going to pour his wrath out on Satan, on the devil, on the Antichrist, and all the devil worshipers, and pour out his wrath upon his bride, the church, his children at the same time? Why would he do that? It makes no sense at all. You don't treat your enemies the same way you treat your children. Why do you think God's going to treat his children the same way he treats his enemies? It's illogical. The church is not going to be here for this time. We are the children of God, adopted as sons and daughters. We're the bride of Christ. The wrath of God during the tribulation period is poured out on God's enemies. And God treats his enemies different than he treats his children. Certainly Jesus is going to treat his enemies different than he's going to treat his bride. He said, these shall be punished, verse 9, with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day and to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you also was believed. So God distinguishes between his enemies and between his children. Jesus distinguishes between the devil and between his bride, the church. It would be irrational for us to think otherwise. And I think unscriptural, actually, for us to think that the church is going to be here for any part of the tribulation period, but especially the last three and a half years, uh, the great tribulation period. Remember, as we've studied previously, the tribulation period is called the time of whose trouble? The church's trouble? No, Israel's trouble. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob 
is the name of Israel before um, Israel was Israel. Israel was Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and he had 12 sons, and they became the 12 tribes of Israel, and they became a nation. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. In Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7, we're told that this time period is called the period of Jacob's trouble. This is the time that God is going to show Israel that they missed the first coming of Jesus Christ, and they're going to have to run to the hills and beg and plead and pray that God would deliver them from the Antichrist, and Jesus Christ is going to return at the second coming and save them. And they are going to believe on him whom they pierced. They're going to mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10 tell us this, the time of Jacob's trouble. In Daniel chapter 12, Daniel uh, talks about this period of time, and Daniel says that this is uh, going to be a very, very difficult time for the children of Israel. He says this in Daniel 12 and verse 1. At that time, Michael, the archangel, shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, Jacob's trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Who's Daniel's people? Not the church. Daniel's people is the nation of Israel. That's who he's concerned about. This is the great prince who stands watch over your people, Daniel. This is not the church. It's the nation of Israel. There's going to be a time of great trouble, such as never was since there was a nation. Which nation? The nation of Israel, even to that time. And at that time, your people, Daniel, the Jews, Israel, shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. This is the culmination of everything to save the nation of Israel because God made promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David that he must fulfill, that have yet not yet been fulfilled. The church hasn't fulfilled all the promises to Israel. Remember in Romans chapter 11, verses 26 and 27, after the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, what happens? All of Israel will be saved. That's in the New Testament, by the way, for some who say, oh no, that's all the Old Testament. No, it's the New Testament too. Revelation, or sorry, Romans chapter 11, verses 26 and 27, all Israel will be saved when their Messiah comes from Zion and saves the nation of Israel. God made a covenant with Abraham in verses 1, 2, and 3, where he said, you're going to have a promised land, the land of the nation of Israel. You're going to be made a great nation. You're going to have a great name, and you are going to be a blessing through the nation of Israel. The whole earth is going to be blessed. God then later promised to David that one of his seed is going to be the king over the whole earth. He's going to have an everlasting kingdom that's going to be forever and ever. That hasn't happened yet. There isn't a king of the Jews who's ruling over the earth forever, not in a physical, literal kingdom. You could say, well, Jesus is the king of the Jews. Indeed, he is, but they rejected him. Jesus doesn't have a physical, literal kingdom right now. Jesus has a spiritual kingdom ruling over the hearts of his people. There is going to be, because there's a promise to Israel that one of the offspring of King David, of his lineage, of his family tree, is going to rule and reign over the earth with an everlasting kingdom. This still has to be fulfilled because it has not yet come to fruition. One prophecy that tells us this is 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 12, where God is telling David, David wanted to build a house for God. God told David, no, you're not going to build the house for me. Your son Solomon's going to build a house for me. He says, but David, tell you what, I'm going to build you a house. You want to build me a house? I'm going to build you a house. And then he tells David this in 2 Samuel 7, 12. When your days are fulfilled, the Lord says to David, and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed or your progeny, someone from your body, from your very loins, someone who is a descendant of you physically. I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom and he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his son or I will be his father and he shall be my son. He says in verse 16 of 2 Samuel 7, and your house, David, and your kingdom shall be established forever 
before you. Your throne shall be established forever. Now David died. Solomon died. All the offspring of David died. We don't even know who they are anymore because they're lost to the annals of history. So there's a promise of God that has not yet been fulfilled. But we know that Jesus is of the lineage of David. We know that Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. We know that Jesus, even through Mary and his stepfather Joseph, they both trace their descendancy, their ancestry back to King David. We know this is a messianic prophecy of Jesus Christ that has not yet been fulfilled. There's going to be an everlasting kingdom with the throne in Jerusalem with the king of the line of David that's going to rule and reign over the earth for how long? He says it three times here in this promise, forever, an everlasting kingdom, an everlasting throne. The tribulation period is all about saving the nation of Israel. In Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, we put this on Christmas cards. For unto us a child is born. Speaking of this Messiah that's going to come through the family tree of David. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and of his peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. This hasn't happened yet, guys. God has unfulfilled promises to the Jews that must be fulfilled. Otherwise, otherwise God is breaking his word, and God cannot lie. He can't break his word. This is related to the coming of Jesus Christ coming back to the earth to establish the messianic kingdom for Israel. We're going to be with Jesus. Jesus is not coming for his church at the end of the tribulation period. He's coming with his church, with the saints, Revelation 19 tells us, following him on white horses. He comes for the church at the rapture, which is an imminent thing. It could happen any minute, any time. Jesus comes for his church. But at his second coming, he's coming for Israel, and he's coming with his church. You remember in Daniel chapter 9, we looked at this on Sunday morning. And verse 24, the angel Gabriel told Daniel, 77s are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. What is this speaking of? It's speaking about national salvation for Israel. Is this for the church? Does this have anything to do with the church? No. These 77s or 490 years are determined for your people, Daniel. I'm sorry, but the Americans are not Daniel's people. We're not his people. The Jews are Daniel's people. For your people, Daniel, and for your holy city. Visalia is not the city that the angel had in mind. Or Los Angeles, or New York, or anywhere else besides what city? Jerusalem, you see. Seventy weeks are determined. For your people, the Jews, for your holy city, Jerusalem. And what's going to happen when these 490 years are completed? There's going to be the finish of transgression, the end of sins, reconciliation for iniquity, the establishment of everlasting righteousness, the culmination and sealing up of all vision and prophecy, which means that all the prophecies of the Bible will have been fulfilled and the anointing of the most holy place where the anointed one, Jesus Christ, takes his seat on the throne of God in the temple of God in Jerusalem. Has this happened yet, guys? Has the nation of Israel been saved yet? No, not yet. So this is still yet future. This prophecy was given over 2,600 years ago. Some of it has been fulfilled as we looked at on Sunday, the first 483 years of the 490 years, 69 of the seven year, uh, 69 of the 77 year periods have been fulfilled. We looked at that, how the decree was given in 445 BC. Some scholars say it was 444 BC. It's neither here nor there. Whatever it was, whether it was 444 or 445 BC, when the, in the month of Nisan, the month of March, when the decree was given by King Artaxerxes or King Ashaharis of the Medo-Persian Empire, actually the Persian Empire, told Nehemiah, I'm going to give a decree to you, Nehemiah, that you get to go and restore and rebuild Jerusalem. That started, let's say, 445 BC. You count forward for 483 years or 69 seven-year periods of time. 
173,880 days. What happened at that time? Jesus Christ rode into Jerusalem on a donkey on that very day to present himself as their Messiah. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks or 69 seven year periods of time. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, the seven and 62, Messiah shall be cut off but not for himself. He's going to be killed. Incredibly. The angel Gabriel showed Daniel that Jesus Christ was going to come in, present himself to the nation of Israel as their Messiah, Messiah the Prince, and they're going to kill him. He's going to be rejected. It was all predicted to happen, and it happened exactly as the Bible predicted. Again, in Luke, uh, in chapter, let's see, Luke, let me find it here. Luke chapter 19 and verse 41, as Jesus was riding in on that Palm Sunday on the donkey in fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, your king is coming to you riding on a donkey lowly and riding on the foal uh, of an ass or the foal of a donkey. Jesus rode into Jerusalem and it says that he wept over the city of Jerusalem saying, if you had known Jerusalem, the Jews, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes for the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground and they will not leave in you one stone upon another. Why? Because you did not know the day or the time of your visitation. They should have known because Daniel told them exactly when it was going to happen. In Daniel's writing. To the very day. Jesus said this your day. He came in on the appointed day. But they rejected him. Exactly as the prophecy said. He's going to be killed. But not for himself. No. He's going to be killed for the sins of the world. He died for your sins. And for mine. The Lamb of God. Who takes away the sins of the world. So again. There were 70 sevens. Or 77 year periods of time in order to fulfill national salvation for Israel. 69 of those seven-year periods of time were fulfilled at Jesus' first coming. The stopwatch stopped. The church age is parenthetical. When we see after the 62 weeks, Daniel 9, 26, after the 483 years, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. There's a comma there when he's killed, and this comma is the church age. Age. The prophecy at that point stopped. The stopwatch stopped. There's still one more week left. One more seven-year period of time. Look at this. It's already 7.51. I'm not even done with my introduction here. How do I always end up running out of time? We looked at it on Sunday. How the week... For the Jews could be a week of seven days or a week of seven years. Remember, we looked at Rachel and we looked at Leah, Rachel's older, ugly sister that ended up marrying him. And he was tricked by uh, Laban, his father-in-law. And he said, serve me for seven more years, finish off her week, and I'll give you the other wife also. And then we read that he told in Genesis 31, he told Laban, I served you for 14 years for your two daughters. And earlier we're told that it was for two weeks, a week of seven years rather than seven days. So this is what we're looking for. We're looking for another week of seven years, one more seven-year period of time to fulfill all of these prophecies. Now what's interesting is Daniel was in Babylon while he was studying the prophecies of Jeremiah. We don't have time, but you can go look at Jeremiah 29, uh, verses 10 and 11, and Jeremiah 25, verses 11 and 12, where the prophet Jeremiah, who was writing prior to Daniel's writings, uh, Jeremiah, God showed him that the Jews are going to be in Babylon for a 
year period of time. Daniel realized 70 years were almost completed since 606 BC that they were in Babylon. And so Daniel began to pray. He began to seek the Lord. We read in Daniel 9 verse 1, in the first year of Darius, the son of Asher Harris of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Then I set my face toward the Lord to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. He realized the 70 years are almost up. Now, why were they in Babylon for 70 years? Interesting, because each one of the years they were in Babylon was a representation of a seven-year period of time that they did not allow the land of Israel to have its sabbatical year or its year of following the land that they were living in. In Leviticus chapter 25, uh, verses 2 to 5, God commanded the Jews, when I bring you into your own land, you could work the land for six years, but on the seventh year, you give the land a rest. Every six years you work, the seventh year, you don't plow, you don't plant And I'm going to give you enough food in the sixth year to provide for the seventh year. And then in the eighth year, you start to plant again. It was God's brilliant strategy for keeping nutrients in the soil, for keeping minerals and vitamins in the soil to let the land go fallow every seventh year. Well, we're told in 2 Chronicles in chapter 36 that the Jews did not allow the land to rest for how long? For 490 years, interesting parallel, isn't it? Remember 70 times 7, 490 years are appointed for your people, for your holy city. They had 490 years where they did not obey God. They did not give the land its rest. So God said, I'm going to yank you out of the land, send you to Babylon for 70 years because every sixth year, on the seventh year, you should have given the land a rest, have a sabbatical year. You didn't do it. I'm pulling you out of the land for 70 years to make up for the 70 sabbatical years that you did not allow the land to be fallow. Daniel understood the 70 years were almost up. He's praying. He's seeking God. The angel Gabriel comes in response and, and basically tells him, yeah, Daniel, this, this, this is almost over. You're, you're right. You're about to go back to your land. But then the angel Gabriel told him way more than what Daniel had bargained for. He told him all about the things, even of the Antichrist and of the coming of the Messiah and of the second coming of Jesus Christ or the establishment of the seven-year period of time uh, for, for the Antichrist to come on the scene. Again, in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26, after the 62 weeks, the 7 and 62, the 69, 483 years, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war desolations are determined. Now, interesting. Who destroyed the city of Jerusalem after Messiah was cut off and the sanctuary, which is the temple? It was the Romans. It was, it was General Titus, who was Emperor Vespasian's oldest son. Titus, Emperor Titus, uh, General Titus, who sacked the city of Jerusalem and uh, pillaged the, the temple and uh, burnt it to the ground. Titus later became the emperor of Rome. Uh, following in the steps of his father Vespasian. This happened in 70 AD. And so this is exactly what God said was going to happen. The city's going to be destroyed after you reject the Messiah. The city's going to be destroyed. By who? By the people of the prince who is to come. So what does that tell us? It tells us that the Antichrist, the prince who is to come, who's going to make a covenant with the many for the last week, and that's going to kick off the seven-year tribulation period, is going to come out of a revived Roman Empire because it was the Romans who destroyed the temple and destroyed the city of Jerusalem and burnt it to the ground in 70 AD. Verse 27 says, Then he shall confirm a covenant or a treaty with many or with many nations and the nation of Israel for one week. How long is a week according to this prophecy? It's a seven-year period of time. What is the tribulation period? It's a seven-year period of time. Who's it pertaining to? The nation of Israel, to the Jews, not to the church. The church has nothing to do with the tribulation, not any of it. Not half of it, not a third of it, not a pre-wrath part of it. We don't have anything to do with the tribulation. It's all for the salvation and the fulfillment of the prophecies to the nation 
of Israel. Remember, when Jesus was here, Jesus said in John chapter 5 and verse 43 to the religious leaders of the Jews who were rejecting him, Jesus said, I come to you in my Father's name and you will not have me. You reject me. One will come in his own name later and him you will listen to or him you will believe. They rejected Jesus Christ. They didn't want him. They said, well, we'll not have this man to rule over us. Well, guess what? When the Antichrist comes on the scene, they are going to accept him and believe that he is their Messiah until he burns them with the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet that Jesus was referring to back in Matthew chapter 24. We're told he's going to confirm a covenant with many for one week or for a seven-year period of time. This is what starts the stopwatch again in the final seven-year period of this prophecy. And at the end of the seven-year period, Jesus Christ returns to the earth to set up his kingdom. He's going to confirm a covenant for a week. That starts the tribulation period. But in the middle of the week, he's going to bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. This is the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet that Jesus refers to in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15. The Antichrist is going to deceive the Jews. They're going to believe that the Antichrist is their Messiah. They're going to believe he's their Messiah. Why? Because he is going to create a, a covenant or a treaty with the nations that are going to permit them to rebuild their temple. And you ask the ultra-Orthodox Jews today, who do you think the Messiah is going to be? They'll tell you right away, the one who allows us to rebuild our temple and begin to offer animal sacrifices according to the book of Leviticus, this is our Messiah. And this is going to be how they're going to be duped, how they're going to be tricked to believe that the Antichrist is their Messiah. Halfway through this week, 42 months, 1260 days, three and a half years into the seven-year period of time, he is going to bring an abomination that uh, the, the abomination of desolation into the Holy of Holies. He is going to go in to the Holy of Holies. He's going to stop all their sacrifices. He's going to sit on the mercy seat on wherever they're going to put a mercy seat because no one knows where the Ark of the Covenant is. He's going to go into the Holy of Holies, turn around, and demand that he uh, uh, be worshipped as God. He's going to declare he is God, and he's going to demand to be worshipped as God. And that's when Jesus says, run to the hills, flee. Woe to you if you're pregnant or you're nursing a baby. Pray that this doesn't happen in the winter because the roads may be washed out or there may be snow on the roads. And pray this doesn't happen on a Shabbat or on a Sabbath day because all the public transportation shuts down in Jerusalem and flee to the hills. This is the abomination of desolation that takes place when the Antichrist goes into the temple of God, declares that he is God, and demands to be worshipped as God. We'll read about it when we get to Revelation chapter 13. It's interesting because we're told that he's killed or he is presumably, presumably killed. Likely, according to Zechariah, he's likely assassinated the Antichrist, and then he comes back to life. He's a false Jesus. He's a counterfeit. He's going to pretend to do the things that Jesus did. Jesus was killed, and Jesus was re resurrected. This one is going to be apparently killed, and then apparently resurrected, and then that's when he goes in and says that he's God and to be worshipped as God. In Revelation 13, this is also the time when he demands that everyone take the mark of the beast on their right hand or their forehead, the 666, and if you don't take the mark of the beast, you're going to be rounded up in prison and beheaded. This is the abomination of desolations spoken of by Daniel the prophet that Jesus refers to. Paul the apostle refers to it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We don't have time to go there right now. We'll try and get there at some point during this teaching in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Before the Antichrist can be revealed, though, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the restrainer has to be removed out of the way. Who's the restrainer? He's the Holy Spirit that is within the church. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came in power to take up residence within God's people. At the rapture, the church is going to be taken up, and it's going to go back to the way it was prior to the church age. And the Spirit of God is still going to be everywhere, but the Spirit of God is not going to be possessing His people in the sense of taking up residence within the people of God. 
Just like it was in the Old Testament times, the Spirit of God would come upon people and lead people, come upon people and lead people. For the church, the Holy Spirit comes and lives with us forever, inside of us. That is going to end at the rapture. The restrainer is going to be removed off the earth, and then the Antichrist, that wicked one, that man of sin, who deceives the whole world, will come to power. So much more that I want to get to, but I just do not have time. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 50. And this is another prophecy that there's going to be a national salvation for the Jews that must come to pass. It hasn't happened yet, which means it's still yet future. In Jeremiah chapter 50, towards the end of the prophet's writings, the prophecies of Jeremiah, he says this in verse 4. In those days, Jeremiah 50, verse 4, and in that time, says the Lord, the children of Israel shall come, they and the children of Judah together. With continual weeping they shall come and seek their God. Verse 5 of Jeremiah 50, they shall ask the way to Zion or to Jerusalem with their faces toward it, saying, Come, let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that will not be forgotten. This prophecy has never yet been fulfilled. It is still future where the Jews are going to come weeping to Jerusalem, seeking out Jehovah, seeking out Yahweh, the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, to enter into an eternal, perpetual covenant with the Lord. And then we read in Jeremiah 50, verse 19, God says after he's going to punish Babylon, because remember there's another Babylon uh, in the book of Revelation that God is going to punish at his second coming. He says this, but I will bring back Israel to his home and he shall feed on Carmel and Bashan, the hills there around Israel, and his soul shall be satisfied <clears throat> on Mount Ephraim and Gilead, verse 20 of Jeremiah 50, in those days and in that time, says the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought, but there shall be none, and the sins of Judah but they shall not be found, for I will pardon those <clears throat> whom I preserve. This is future, guys. This has not happened. The nation of Israel still dead in their trespasses and sins. The ultra-Orthodox ultra -Orthodox and Orthodox Jews and Judaism, they're still dead in their trespasses and sins. So this has not yet been fulfilled. But it's going to be fulfilled at the second coming of Jesus Christ when they're restored to their land. And then God says, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought and there shall be none and the sins of Judah and they shall not be found. Why? Because I'm going to pardon those whom I preserve. This is speaking about what Daniel was speaking about in Daniel 9 chapter, uh, uh, verse 24, finish the transgression, make an end of sins, make reconciliation for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal it vision and prophecy, and anoint the most holy. It's all for Israel and for Jerusalem. Future hasn't happened yet. When's it going to happen? When Jesus Christ returns at the end of the tribulation period. Nothing to do with the church. Absolutely nothing to do with the church, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ. And then in Zechariah chapter 12, this is where we're going to have to end, in verse 10. <clears throat> After the Lord returns to fight against the Antichrist, to set his feet upon the Mount of Olives, to destroy the Antichrist and all the armies that are gathered there against Israel at the Battle of Armageddon, we see this. I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Zechariah 12, 10, the spirit of grace and supplication, then they will look on me whom they pierced, Jesus says. Yes, and they will mourn for him, for Jesus Christ, as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Why? Because they're going to recognize they missed Jesus, who he was at his first coming. The only begotten son of God. They rejected him. They said, we will not have this man rule over us. The second time he comes, they're going to recognize who he is. He's their Mashiach. 
He is their anointed one. He is their savior. He is their king, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And then chapter 13 and verse 1 says of Zechariah, In that day a fountain shall be opened for the house of David, for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for sin and uncleanness. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of all the idols from the land, and they shall no longer be remembered. This is the national salvation for the Jews. Hasn't happened yet. So it's going to happen in the future. When's it going to happen? Well, according to the Bible and according to the prophecies that we've just looked at, it's going to happen at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Again, we are not looking for the Antichrist. I don't believe the Antichrist is going to be revealed until the restrainers are moved off the earth. And that means that the church is going to be gone before the Antichrist is going to be revealed. And how is the Antichrist going to be revealed? He's going to make a peace treaty with the nation of Israel that's going to result in them rebuilding their temple and reinstituting their Levitical animal sacrifices. And we're not going to be here to see any of it. We're going to be in heaven like John, metatauta. After these things, John, come up here and we are going to be in heaven with our bridegroom. We are going to enjoy the marriage supper of the Lamb with our bridegroom. Jesus Christ. We're going to receive the rewards for the things that we have done for the Lord. We're going to receive our rewards at that time. And then we are going to return with Jesus Christ according to Revelation chapter 19. And we'll get there when we get through all the book of Revelation. You'll see all this that I'm, you know, giving you a little bit of a heads up on what's coming. We're going to return with Jesus to set up his kingdom. We're going to be right there with him when he comes back to save Israel, to judge Satan, to judge the Antichrist, and to judge sin once and for all. One more message on Sunday, and then we'll, we'll move back into our expository study through the book of Revelation. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for telling us all of these things in advance. Lord, I know it's a lot of information. I know, especially if it's, if it's totally new information for many here today, it could be overwhelming. But um, I do thank you, Lord, that these messages are recorded so that we could go back and anyone who's interested can go back and listen to them again and pause and rewind and really take the time to understand um, what your word says about these very, very crucial and critical prophecies to the salvation of Israel and to the rapture of the church, Lord. Lord, we know that no one knows the day or the hour of your coming, so you tell us, Lord, to watch. You tell us to be ready. You tell us to not be drunkards and to not be fornicators and uh, not be caught up with all of the cares of this world, Lord, but that we are to keep our eyes on you, Lord, because it might be today, Lord, that you come back for your church. And Lord, you promise that we are going to escape all of the things that are coming upon the earth. Lord, thank you that you have not appointed us under wrath, but unto salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, bless your people, Father. Continue to bless our church. Continue, Lord, to protect us from all the attacks and the deceptions of the enemy, Lord, and just strengthen us in these last days, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.